Good evening, good evening. Welcome everyone to IKG's Wisdom Wednesday. I am your IKG coordinator and host, Sister Ajwa, and we are so happy to have you here this evening. As you all are coming in, we ask that you, you know, let us know who's here, who's in the building, and where you're coming from. So just want to start off by just saying we appreciate you being here, and we just want to highlight some places of, of where the family is checking in from. So we have New York in the house, Maryland, Florida, Georgia, of course, D.C. Uh, we have uh, Texas, Oregon, uh, Atlanta, Georgia, Pennsylvania, North Carolina, Brooklyn, South Carolina, California, just calling up New Orleans. All right, LA is in the house. Wonderful, wonderful. Uh, Mississippi, thank you for joining us. Compton, California, Vancouver, Canada, London. All right, family from around the world. Yes, thank you all for joining us. So Wisdom Wednesdays, is a free monthly lecture series that IKG hosts every third Wednesday of the month. And we're, they're usually held in person here in Washington, DC, but due to um, the pandemic, we've been going virtual. So we're very happy to be able to welcome people from all over the world to join us in our Wisdom Wednesday presentations. We bring in uh, speakers that speak to issues related to African culture, history, politics, spirituality, finance. So we hope that you're able to gain some new understanding from our presentations. And before we get started, we would like to share um, a couple, um, one uh, major announcement as I'm sure the family's aware of, we lost, uh, well, brother Ronoko Rashini has made his transition into becoming an ancestor. And so IKG will be hosting an event to recognize and honor Ronoko. And this, will take place on Sunday, August 22nd via Zoom. It is remembrances and reflections on the life and legacy of Dr. Renoko Rashidi. On June 20th, Renoko and Tony hosted their first brother to brother Zoom presentation. And they plan to have another one on August 22nd to discuss their summer travels in Africa. Due to Renoko Rashidi's uh, passing, the program has been shifted and it will now be an evening remembering and reflecting on Renoko's great and mighty walk. And we will hear from some of his family and friends. It will feature remembrances by Carol and Donald Strong, Renoko's sister and brother-in-law, and Joyce King, Renoko's cousin as well as reflections by LeGrand Clay, Annette Blake, James Small, Carl Nelson, Charles Finch, Atlantis Browder, and Paul Coates. And it will be hosted by Tony Browder. Again, this will take place on Sunday, August 22nd from 6.30 to eight o'clock. The cost is $30 and 80% of the proceeds from the program will go directly to Renoko's 14 year old daughter, Asada. So we encourage everyone to register for this event and we will place a link to register in the chat. And again, this will take place on Sunday, August 22nd. And we do hope that you're able to join. And now for tonight's presentation. Tonight, we are very pleased to present to you Brother Mwebe Nshangi, 
who will be speaking or giving us a discussion of his book, A Pot to Piss In, Intergenerational Wealth Planning for Black People. So first, let me tell you a little bit about our speaker. And Weber Ishangi is a former brand marketing strategist for the NBA, National Basketball Association. And Webe demystifies financial literacy and shares how he went from loyal corporate employee to financially sustainable living off his savings and investments. Ishangi now teaches personal finance, business, and career development skills. The author of six books, including his latest, A Pot to Piss In, Intergenerational Wealth Planning for Black People, Ishangi explains there are numerous ways to create individual and intergenerational financial sustainability by following similar playbooks of those well-to-do families that have been able to live off their savings and investments for generations. Hearing his talk and taking his master online course, you'll learn the cryptic or hidden ways of how rich families have been able to keep their wealth for two, for two centuries, despite recessions and market crashes. You'll leave with a new understanding on strategies to save for retirement, as well as create residual income, enabling you to work for yourself and even leave the rat race before falling victim to corporate ageism. So for tonight's program specifically, Mbwebe Ishangi shares that no matter how much education you have, educational and financial institutions will never teach you how to manage money. If they did, they'd be rendered powerless, jeopardizing their bottom line. Make money off your ignorance. We've been taught managing money is challenging to the point of intimidation, primarily because of the lack in awareness on other tactics available. Because of this, many become disinterested in dealing with their finances and accept financial issues as something we will always have. We know we're sinking in debt, but don't know how deep. Is it three feet or 100 feet? To address this need, and Webber Ishangi created the Crypto Work Financial Sustainability Movement and his fifth book, A Pot to Piss In, Intergenerational Wealth Planning for Black People, where he shares intricate money-making methods and practices that will enable you to liberate yourself financially without having to work for someone, eliminating the anxiety of ultimate, of untimely job and wage loss, and or the fictitious security our traditional saving models fail to live up to. So please join me now in welcoming Brother Ngwebe Ishangi. Thank you. All right, greetings. Greetings, everyone. Man, it's such a pleasure. Um, and I first have to give kudos to each and every one of you who have tuned in this evening. There could have been a hundred different things you could do this evening. It's a summer night. You could be out doing summer things, um, but instead you chose to invest your time into listening to me around my mouth for an hour and a half, <laughs> roughly. <laughs> but I give thanks for that. Um, and I, I, I hope that I can deliver uh, some good information that uh, is edible and digestible, and more importantly, that you can implement into your lives, not only your personal lives, but even your bloodline and your family. Okay, so I'm gonna share my screen real quick here. Um, let me go back and make sure that everything is where it needs to be. I am sharing my screen. All right. And I'm going to blow it up. Come on. Let me blow it up. All right. And all I need is confirmation from someone to let me know that they see everything right. And that even when I go to this next screen and you can see the next screen as well. Can yeah. I get a, okay, perfect. Okay, so this evening, yeah, we're gonna talk about a pot to piss in, uh, intergenerational wealth planning, a discussion about finances um, and, and figure out how we can really live the lives that we've really been born to do opposed to 
the life that, you know, somehow money got in the way and determined for us, okay? Um, as mentioned, if there are any questions, uh, please feel free to put those in the Q&A section and please feel free to take notes. Um, you know, this is information that I'm hoping, uh, if you have seen before, it will help just reaffirm what you know. And if this is the first time you've heard, um, hopefully that you can jot this down because I'm really not uh, taking time for granted anymore as we lost Brother Renoko Rashidi last week. I mean, you know, we never know when our time is. So while we are here, let's be present in the present and present presence. Uh, with that said, um, I'm all about giving flowers, you know, most importantly, because, uh, you know, a lot of elders are, are transitioning now and um, their works are, are here for us to study. Uh, but in most times, we don't really give them the accolades and the love and the just the, uh, at, um, the, the admiration while they're here. Uh, my Jegna, uh, Anthony Brown, I just want to give flowers to because without him, this platform, Wisdom Wednesdays, wouldn't be happening. Uh, we wouldn't have an African or an African presence or people of African descent in the United States over in Kemet today uh, doing excavations and reclaiming the fact that the original Egyptian or Kemetic dynasties were actually founded and created by African dark melanated people. Um, the works that he's been doing for over 30 some odd years uh, needs to be celebrated while he is still here. And the best way that we can give flowers is not only reading his books, attending his lectures, going to his trips, the the tour, uh, the uh, Egypt on the Potomac that's in DC or going to uh, his trips with him in Kemet, but also supporting him financially. His website is ikg.info.com, uh, making a, a contribution to the Ace of Restoration Project which has been, I believe it's in the 13th year, I believe, or 14th year um, of excavating two 2,700-year-old uh, um, uh, Kushite uh, temples, tombs that uh, have been financed through African-American dollars. So let's continue that going and you know, let's give mm -hmm. him his flowers while he's here. So I just want to do that first before presenting this evening. Um, so I want to start out with these basic questions that you don't need to answer out loud, but to yourself, ask yourself and, and ask this to yourself these questions and what your answers may be. What would you do first if you showed up to work on Monday and found out you were being let go? Um, what would be the first thing you think about? I know for me, the first thing I would think about would be about my cash flow. You know, uh-oh, how am I going to be able to pay my bills, right? Second question is two parts. A is do you live paycheck to paycheck? And if so, what is your plan to earn more? Um, and then B, if you do not, if not, if you don't live paycheck to paycheck, do you have more than six months savings? And the last question is, have you ever said, amidst all the chaos, because you know all of us don't really love our jobs, is that uh, you know the, the, the managers get on our nerves and all that kind of stuff, coworkers, all the whole nine. Um, but in the end, we'll say, but I really can't complain. At least I have a job. Um, if you are that person, you need to refer back to question number one, because again, you could show up on a Monday or even leaving on a Friday and your job could be let go. So what are we doing to break this cycle? Because whereas before, you know, our parents and maybe even more so our grandparents had jobs they kept for their entire careers. Um, a lot of us are not keeping our jobs for more than four or five years and having to find another job. So that is a, a, a level of stress and anxiety that we have and, and wondering, am I, am I going to get the pink slip today or you know, is my job secure because job security is becoming uh, a thing of the past. Um, opening fact for all you Wu-Tang fans, we all know about the score, uh, the, the track Cream, um, but instead of cash, uh, you know, really is if currency rules everything around me, shouldn't we have a better understanding about it? And that's because I think that there's a conversation that we've yet to really have an intimate conversation about what money is and how it works and how we can use it to benefit us in a way that we won't be tied or tethered to the marketplace of having to show up every Monday when they only pay us just enough to show up. Um, this is a startling remark that I, I read um, that sticks to me has become my daily mantra is if you don't design your own plan, chances are you're following someone else's plan and guess what they have planned for you? Not much. Um, I say that because I speak from personal experience. Um, just to give you a little back tip of myself, uh, I'm a lover of African history and culture. Um, I've been writing for the last 28 years, um, written, I'm working on my sixth book right now. Um, I put out a magazine, started in 1993 called The Ghetto Times, celebrating our 28th year. Um, and for 12 years, I was a corporate 
soldier worker bee for the National Basketball Association as a brand identity marketing specialist. And all that, that sounds great. And being in the NBA was great and all that, being in all-star games and all that. I was living paycheck to paycheck. This is a multi-billion dollar company that wasn't really paying its workers what they could, you know, to, you know, the money wasn't going to us, it's going to the players and, and the top execs basically. But uh, I had a 401k, a little bit of savings, but I had a low credit score. I really didn't have a sustainable escape plan. And then on March 20, on uh, March 13th, I'm sorry, I put the wrong date, March 13th, 2017, I was abruptly fired from my job, not because of my work performance, which I always got high grades on. I actually got fired because of my social media presence, the things that I posted on social media. And if you're familiar at all with the type of things that I, I promote on, our, on my site, or on my page rather, is basically information about our history and how we can you know, basically reclaim our story, our history, our health, our spirituality. And these are the type of things that they felt was a flag against their brand or their shield. So they abruptly fired me. Um, at that point, I was at a crossroads. Because again, that first question, what do you do when you show up on a Monday and you lose your job? Um, I was thinking about my cash flow. And I needed time to think. And I thought, well, you know, immediately I'm thinking I need to go find another job. That's what, the, what you usually do. On automatic, you're thinking about getting back in the rat race, even though you were kicked out. Kicked off the corporate plantation, but we want to get right back on. And so I tried to make that decision. And, and before I did that, I said, let me give myself a couple of days and, you know, let me go ahead and see what I got my 401k that I can probably borrow or pull out to, you know, just give some comfort to myself for a couple of months. Um, and in doing so, I happened to meet with a fellow alumni that worked at Fidelity. Uh, and he started telling me information about uh, finances and, and, and retirement and recessions and things of that nature. And he really... Uh, sparked the plug in me or sparked an idea of me not going back to corporate to the corporate plantation when it came to the point where I was pulling out money in my 401k and I had to put down my occupation on the application and I said well it doesn't seem right for me to put on it that I'm unemployed that might not look good and here's the thing my mindset is thinking the 401k money I'm asking for it it's really my money but I didn't have that mindset I'm thinking I'm asking them can I have my money right so anyway, I put it on there. He said, well, yeah, don't put down that you're unemployed. Why don't you put on there that you live off your savings and investments? And when he said that to me, there was this huge explosion that went in my mind that opened up and lifted the veil of the way people are conditioned to think they have to earn a living. I was been conduced, and a lot of us are believed that the only way we can earn a living is by working for someone. There are people out here that live off of their savings and investments. And they've been doing it for hundreds of years. So when that happened, I realized, I said, oh, this, brother, this guy that messed up, he wasn't a brother, he's a white guy. And I said, I'm going to take this information and bring it back to the hood because we need to know this type of information. And that began my journey to become financially literate. And a few months later, after learning so much and reading and going to lectures and, and getting, taking in as much information I could, I created the Crypto World Financial Sustainability Movement. Um, so what I say is in all this is that what happened to me will happen to you. The question is, are you prepared? We all know about the old uh, story tale, fairy tale of the ant and the grasshopper and how the ant spent the entire summer gathering food because he knew that winter was coming and the grasshopper was like, man, why are you working so hard? This is summertime, you should chill. Just come hang out with me, whatever. Why are you working so hard? And the ant is like, nah, because winter's coming. And so, sure enough, when winter came and the grasshopper having gathered no food for the winter, had nothing and fortunately he was able to knock on the ant's door and the ant let him in now the reality is in today's world not too many people are going to let you in so the bottom line is not only is it just in season as in fall winter summer spring but also in your life you know you become a young your child you become an adult and then you're going to become an elder when you become an elder that's that winter time when you're no longer able to go out and earn a living there is a corporate thing called corporate ageism where you are just too old to work so if you don't have enough put away, um, you're going to have to find another way to, uh, to survive. And a lot of us don't understand it until it's too late. The fact is, is that no employer is obligated to pay you for your life, for life. One day you will be laid off, fired, or if lucky, retire. And this is when your income ends. Okay, there's no job that's going to be able to keep for the rest of your life. And if people understood how the economic system works, there'd be a revolution in a minute. This is what Henry Ford, the founder of Ford Motor Company said, you know, because there's a, there's a certain 
uh, lack of information and understanding of how money works that keeps us all in this rat race. But well, we're going to break that cycle tonight. Um, it starts with the socioeconomic deprivation, which is by design. Across every socioeconomic level, POWATIS, and I use it as an acronym for People of African Descent in the United States. Why so? Because there are some people of African, United, African descent that are not from America. They are from the Caribbean, or they're from the UK, or they're from the continent itself, and they are in America. When we start seeing ourselves as a collective and start seeing ourselves as separate, then maybe we could have some serious power and do some things collectively and collaboratively. So I use POWATIS as an acronym. Um, but over one third of POWATIS families have either negative wealth or no assets at all. And the last recession of 2007 to, to, to 10, 2010, 2010, um, the recession wiped out more than half of the Powatas community's wealth, whereas whites only lost 10%. We went from $12,000 per median household, household down to 5,600. And whites dropped from 135,000 to 113. So there's something that's happening as to why. And we just can't just say it's just racism. It's more than just racism. It's economically rooted as well. Uh, the disparity, the update, uh, as of up to 2019, when we were at $5,600, since 2019, we dropped even further to $3,600. Whereas whites have gone up since the last recession from 113,000 to 147,000. So that's the average household income. It's because they're doing something different they're diversifying, and they're also practicing something that we don't know. They're having conversations that we don't have, and we need to change that. The thing is, is that with the title of my book, uh, Apotheopis, and we know that we've heard this before. Uh, we may not have totally understood what that meant, but it is etymologi etymologi etymologically sorry, assigned to Black folk. When we look at the origin of it, uh, back in the day before there was uh, plumbing, there was you know, running water uh, and toilets in the house, uh, you were seen as a person of status. If you need to use, use the restroom to relieve yourself, you would have a bowl in your home and that's where you would relieve yourself and then you would throw it out the window or go out in the back and you know, out the door. That was a level of prestige at back then. This is again, before plumbing and all that kind of stuff. So you know, we barely had we couldn't own the, the, the floor we stood on, you know, coming out of uh, emanci post-emancipation. We couldn't even own that. We couldn't own the four walls or the ceiling above our heads. So we definitely didn't have a pot to piss in. So when you didn't have that pot to piss in, it was an etym etymologically a sign for you to believe that you were dirt poor, or you were worse than poor, okay? And that's something that has transferred down generation to generation throughout our bloodlines, where we are inheriting poverty not only financially, but in the mindset of thinking that this is how it's supposed to be, that you know it's messed up, but this is what it is. Um, but we have been at the bottom as producers while being at the top as consumers. Here's where it's our oxymoronic. You know, uh, when we were eman emancipated in 1863, we had 0.5% of the nation's wealth. That's half of a percent. And as of 2020, really 2021, we've only amassed another half percent. We only have 1% of the nation's wealth. And that's again, because we are more consumer than producer. We are 99% consumer and 1% producer. We're not creating anything. You know, ever since Marcus Garvey in his day, we have not thought about producing for ourselves and doing it on a national and even global scale. Um, a true, truly free people possesses the power to produce as well as consume. This is what Robert Weems Jr. has spoken about. And it's just something that we need to start grasping. We're starting to get it now, but you know we're still so far behind the eight ball. We need we got a lot of catching up to do. But the biggest part of this thing is linked to what is, is is linked to leakage, and leakage basically talks about that dollar community circulation. Um, you know we are at the poorest. You know whereas Asians the dollar stays in their communities for thirty days, in our communities the dollar is gone within six hours. Why is that so? Because in our communities. A lot of the businesses there aren't owned by us. They're owned by other ethnicities who come in and spend their time there and get our dollars and they take that money to their communities. So it's not rocket science. It's just that we have to really think about this big piece of this puzzle. And it's, not, it's really not hard to figure out when you start to line up and connect all the dots. Um, in addition to that, you have to look at the fact that the market, the job market is demeaningly increasing. 61.2% uh, of Americans are unemployed in total. 
And there's an average of 5 million college graduates annually. And they all are coming out, majority of them are coming out in debt because they took out loans. And in six months, they're going to have to start paying those loans back. Well, in the United States in 2019, only 2.1 million jobs were created. Okay. And in January of 2020, there were 16% fewer jobs created than the previous uh, month. And this in October 2019, only 185,000 jobs were created. So we're seeing a low creation of jobs even before the pandemic happened. Now, post pandemic, we've had even more people laid off. So there's even more people trying to vie for these jobs. But as we see, the world is changing. The rising cost, gentrification, the quality of jobs, the type of jobs that are being created, they're mostly part-time so that the companies don't have to be on the, on the uh, books for paying you for benefits. Um, most folks actually need this second job and even third jobs to make ends meet. And we all know that something's not right, but we're just not sure how to address it. And then most of us are afraid to really do something about it, which I call corporate, stock, uh, corporate Stockholm syndrome, uh, because we're afraid to say something. We're afraid to even ask for that raise we so deserve, because if we do, we risk losing our job. If we make any type of complaints in our jobs, you know, we don't want to be put on that list where, you know, that short list where we might be the first one or the next one to go. So we sit there and suffer quietly. Um, in addition to the fact that, you know, those of us that are already in the workspace, we got to look at this influx of graduates every year. High school graduates, there's 3.5 million every year, and there's 5 million, as I mentioned, collegiate graduates. So that's 8.5 million people coming into the labor market every year. And there's only 2.3 up to 2.3 million jobs created. So that's just letting you know there's not enough jobs to supply the demand. Okay. And we're not even counting the folks that are already in the job market that have gotten let go and looking for another job. So that even makes it even more competitive. And 50% of the age group between 16 to 24 are the ones that are losing their jobs most via automation. Um, so again, I already emphasized, no employer is obligated to pay for the rest of your life. Eventually you will be laid off, a victim of downsizing, or you will be fired. And the older you get, the closer you are to losing that job. Companies, they're outsourcing, they're downsizing for cheaper labor. So tenure is out the window. It doesn't matter. In fact, if you've had your job for a long time, you have a certain level of tenure, you've already probably reached the ceiling and they're probably looking to bring in someone that is younger and greener and have you train them and then they take over your job and they let you go. Um, all the while, every 30 days, we have bills that are due. Uh, we have food bills, uh, loans, uh, insurance, things of that nature that we have to pay. And our source of being able to pay that is through our jobs. The thing about that we also need to be aware of is that the, J the job market is changing dramatically. Uh, the job security, one of the things is not because immigrants are taking the jobs, it's because artificial intelligence is taking over. Um, corporations already are getting over with not having to pay next to zero ta taxes. So they're keeping the money in their pocket. But then you have men like Jeff Bezos, who's the owner of Amazon, who decided not even to pay benefits for his part-time workers when he can afford to pay for everyone, but he chooses not to pay for benefits for them. And when they complain and had a walkout, well, you can see now, and if you've ever just taken a look up a video of how their shipping complex works now, the majority of it is automation and moving towards automation. So those workers that were complaining about not getting paid enough, well, you're about to lose your job, okay? They're gonna be all ran by automation. So what is AI? You know, we've been hearing about it. We've been seeing the, all, the perks about it. You know, we see the self-driving cars and thinking, oh, that's great. I ain't got to keep my eye on the wheel. It'll take me where I need to go. Uh, we've gone into McDonald's and don't really talk to anyone until we have to actually pick up our food from someone. We go in there, press buttons on the kiosk and make our order and we're in and out in five minutes. You know, Sam's Club, you know, you can, they're going to have a cashier list and cashless store. You just walk in and you walk out with your goods basically because they're gonna use the facial recognition of artificial intelligence to know who you are and then they're gonna tap that into your account and deduct the money without you even knowing it or having to do anything about it. Um, this is going to become the norm. This is not something that's coming, it's already happening. Within the next five years, the majority of the trucks you see on the highway are gonna be automated. Um, we're seeing the malls are closing down. Why? Because we're doing more and more online shopping. I'm guilty of shopping at Amazon instead of going to a place and picking it up myself. Uh, with that case, if, if, if no one's at the malls and the workers can't sell any goods and they're going to lay the workers off and the malls are going to shut down, this is what's happening. 
the call centers, as you know, we're already talking to robots. So, you know, those people that we used to hear that were actual live people, they're getting replaced by automation. You know, if you were in New York City and you come to Holland Tunnel, uh, you know, there's nobody there anymore. Everything is automated. Either you got an easy pass or you're going to get an invoice in the mail. Uh, all these things, these are workers who used to work here, ded dedicated workers who are now having to find another way of putting food on the table for their families because their job has been lost through automation. Um, Walmart, you know, we have the whole, uh, we thought this was great. Why don't we have the... Uh, the, the, the uh, check the, the place where you can go ahead and check out your stuff yourself. You don't have to wait in that long line and wait for that slow cashier that's scanning everything. Go ahead and scan it yourself. Well, think about the ingenuity of the, of the business owner who thinks, wait a minute, if, if I can have the consumer come into my store, walk up every hour and pick up what they want and have them check out everything and bag it themselves, I don't have to pay workers to be at the cashier. So there's no benefits I have to pay. I don't have to worry about lunch breaks. I don't have to worry about attitudes or no shows. I'm putting the onus on and the labor on to the consumer. This is what we're living in right now. And, and we're thinking on the other side is, oh, this is great. I'm in here in, five, in and out in five minutes. Well, to put the labor on to you. And for every person that's minus that, that's one other person that's in that market trying to find and grab one of those 2.3 million jobs up to that are being created annually. Of us that are old enough to remember what it looks like to go into banks and how there used to be all these tellers. Now the tellers are, are replaced by all of these huge kiosks that can handle every transaction that you need without having to talk to anyone to anyone and again it's quick it's swift it's nice and it's cool but it's replacing the work of a human being who now has to try to find another line of work could be you it could be a family member etc um the first jobs that are being replaced are retail and sales administration and clerical food prep truck driving and transportation and manufacturing these are hundreds of millions of folks that are going to have to find new jobs and most likely they're gonna be trying to find jobs that are out of their space, that they're a career that they never really have been versed in, but they're still competing. Why? Because we need money to take care of our 30 day bill cycle, right? AI is in the, in the midst of eliminating the middle class. Um, and I just wanna put out there that I'm not trying to be David Downer and just make everything seem like this, the, the world is ending, the sky is ending. No, there is in the end, a silver lining to all this, but I need to talk about the reality of what we're facing because we don't have these real candid and very real conversations at all, if not enough. So I feel like, you know, that's why I'm trying to get this information to you out first. Um, in addition to this, this is what's crazy, is uh, automation is going to a whole nother level. You might've seen this robot called Sophia. She got more likes than I do, you know? <laughs> she ain't even real, whoops, let me go back. <clears throat> she got more likes than I do and She's been on Cosmopolitan. She's been on um, all types of talk shows. And she is a robot, a life-size robot. And out of Japan, they're also making robots that are going to perform wifely duties, if you know what I mean. And in addition to that, they are looking to have these robots actually carry babies. So for our sisters, um, just like in the days of Greece, where the men really didn't use the women only but for, for, for procreation because they were too busy being pedophiles to these little, little, um, little boys, I have to put that out there, is that the same thing is happening when we're looking at what type of future they see for our women is that they don't really want you to even be around. Now they don't even want you to have babies because they're gonna probably take the artificial insemination and put it into this android and have the android carry this baby to term. So it's really crazy when we hear about, uh, you know, um, the owner of Tesla, mine escapes me right now, um, Musk, and how he, you know Gates and all these guys are talking about trying to bring in artificial intelligence and merging with the human race. These are things that they are planning. And they can do this, why? Because they are financially astute. They have the time to create these crazy ideas. Well, if we get ourselves on the path of financial sustainability, then we too would have that freedom to create counters. That's what this is all about, understanding what we're against. So Andrew Yang said this. He said, who wins from artificial intelligence? Who wins from innovation? It's going to be Amazon. It's going to be Google, Uber, Facebook, the biggest tech companies that will have the AI that will start displacing workers. The American people will not see much money from that at all. We, POATIS, currently have $1.4 trillion in spending, and that's going to be put in jeopardy because if we're losing the jobs and we're no longer earning and we're no longer purchasing, then that means our purchasing, purchasing power is going to be diminished and we really won't have anything to say on what goes on in this world. 
Uh, so it's important, oh, I'm going backwards, sorry. And so that's the way that it's important for us to understand that money needs to be a topic of conversation for us. Instead, we've been seeing it as a, a means to an end for paying off and sustaining yourself uh, for the moment. We need to look at money as a tool. And we're not taught to think of it as that way because a large portion of our time is spent thinking about making it, but we forget how to use it to get us to achieve the type of visions that we want. We're afraid. We're afraid to talk about money. Um, I know someone raised their hand. Just please put that in the Q&A because we're going to definitely address those questions in the end. Thank you. Um, but we're afraid to talk about money. You know, talking about money is taboo in our, com our communities, mainly because, uh, you know, of all the get togethers that we have, we never really get together to talk about money. And it's because no one really wants to talk about how broke they are. And when you do talk about money, it'll probably end up in a conversation where someone comes out and say, well, where that $20 you still owe me? You ain't gave me like six months ago. And then next thing you know, we fight because we don't know how to have a real conversation about sustainable methods to create wealth. So I asked this question. It's a riddle, really. The pursuit of happiness in the life that we've been sold, the way we've been told to get money is through education. We've been told, go and get your certification, right? Well, what's the strangest thing you've done for money? And the answer to this riddle is I took out a loan to go to school so I could get a job to pay off my school loans. You know, most folks that go to college, if you are in college now or you've been out for a long time, you probably are still paying college loans. You know, all of that time, that the amount of money that we amassed in getting those certifications, most of us aren't even working in those fields anymore. And on top of that, we're paying back loans that have so much accrued interest that it's disabling us to start building wealth for our futures. That's because the educational system isn't designed to free you. We spend our lives looking for someone to hire us because we were told when you're young, what do you want to do? You want to be this? Okay, you got to go and get education. Get that education and you can get certified and you can get this job. That's what it's supposed to be. But when you allow someone to feed you, they can also starve you. That's something that we really have to understand. We've been sold this lie that the path of life is to go get that diploma and that college degree and get a job next and then you'll have a house, the car, the family. You'll have, you know, you put your money in the bank. CDs, bonds, 401k, stock market, and then you retire and you have this vacation and live happily ever after. But they never tell you about how you're going to pay for this. How are you going to accumulate this wealth? That's because we have been programmed to just be a spoke in the wheel and join the labor market and just work until we die. Um, the fact is, is that after we get our, di our diploma and our degrees, we owe in student loans. The, out, the uh, outstanding loans have quadrupled since 2000. That's because tuition has gone high. Um, we can't find work in our degree. And all of this in paying off your loans in addition to living sustainably month to month, paycheck to paycheck, it puts our golden years in peril. There's not enough money to put away for savings, not to mention we don't know what the price of things with inflation is going to be when we do retire 20, 30, 40 years from now. That dollar I'm putting away now is probably going to be worth 10 cents 40 years from now. So the money you're putting away now may not even amass to what you nearly need if you are going to be um, uh, retiring in the next 10 or 20, 20 years. So we've been sold this lie. You get the degree. You know, you're going to climb that ladder of success because all we're doing is trying to grab that bag, right? This is the goal is to get that money, right? But the reality is that we come out deeper in debt than when we before we went in. That's why some high school students, uh, high school graduates rather, have less debt by the time we come out of college because they didn't go to college. So they have less debt and they're closer to creating uh, retirement savings. Now they might not make as much, but they don't have as much debt. They have an upstart on their future than we do that have college degrees. Um, and then you try to find a job and you can't find a job. So you basically end up taking any job. 70% of baristas at Starbucks have college degrees. They did not go to college to, to work at Starbucks, okay? And that accrues or compounds the amount of debt you have because in most cases, you can't afford to make the full payments. So you're getting hit over the head with accrued interest. This disparity has basically been affecting us more so than anyone else, any other ethnic race, um, because Pilates with the BAA, BA has a median net worth that is only two thirds of a white person without a bachelor's. Okay, so that's where the economic disparity comes in. That's where the racism comes in in the whole nine. But the bottom line is while we're chasing these degrees and we get these degrees, the jobs are not being delivered. And if we do get a job, 
uh, you know, the amount that we're getting paid isn't worth or isn't worthy of what we went to school for. Uh, it's not designed, as I mentioned to free you, we go to school in hopes of being able to earn. That's the bottom line. A lot of us go to school for that, to get that top, to get that six figure job. But we're taught to study occupations instead of money. We go to school for what do you like to do? Well, what if you just like to understand how money work? I bet you if you understood how money work and you would have more money than you have a job, all right? We're conditioning to think jobs are the only way to create income and the resulting is becoming corporate B soldiers working for money instead of money working for us. So let me give an example of someone that for 30 years, they got to pay $100,000. So even if you make $100,000 and you make that six figure level come out of college and for 30 years, you got paid $100,000, you would think, okay, that's going to give me about $3 million in about 30 years. That's pretty good. And say you invested about 5% of that each year. Uh, so that jumped it up to about 6.6%, uh, 6.6 .6 million rather. And then say you were smart in investing just a little bit of it. You just invested 5% in some stocks, bonds, whatever. At the end of that 30 years, it jumped up to 12.9 million. That's looking pretty good for a career, you know, a working career of 12.9 million earned. But we didn't factor in the three eroding factors. There's taxes, which takes away 40% on the dollar. So that's going to drop that 12.9 to 7.7 million. And then we have loans, be it mortgages, car loans, school loans, et cetera. That's another 35% that's going to drop it down to 3.2 million career earning. And then our lifestyle, you know, eating, uh, you know, uh, extra activities, things of that nature, vacations, 23.5%. So that's going to drop us down to $194,000. So a person that's making $100,000 for 30 years will pretty much end up with $194,000 at the end of the day when he's retired. 98.5% of our money is lost in these eroding factors. That's because we are not putting the money to work. We are earning the money and then we're spending it. We're not putting it to work. And when we do put it in certain type of things like the market, stock market, et cetera, we're not aware of the low returns that you get. Now let's talk about the retirement system because that also is not working on any, anymore. Um, imagine that you were two years away from retirement and you see a 401k um, tank for about 20%. Well, that happened in 2008 when millions of workers, including myself, I lost $250,000 in my 401k. And not being well versed about what that actually is, I thought that this recession was a fluke. It was, you know, just came out of the blue. It doesn't, it's not going to happen again in my lifetime. But as I did a little bit of research, recessions have been happening ever since we started this monetary system. And we're averaging a, re a recession every 10 to 12 years. And as of late, they've been going anywhere between four and five sometimes. Um, the last recession of 2007 to 2010, the retirement community, those that were already retired and had their money in their savings and already did their work for their 30 plus years of, of service had $2.4 trillion lost in that last recession. That money was not replaced. That $250,000 that I lost was not replaced. I didn't even get a sorry. Um, what happens is next is that that meant that the elderly couldn't, they really couldn't, there was not a lot of jobs, a lot of jobs for them because of corporate ages and they're too old to go and get jobs, right? So they ended up losing their homes. They couldn't afford their doctor visits or their medication. They ended up having to move in with family. Uh, some of them even died because their way of life was taken away from them. All the savings that they put away was taken away. And some of them uh, tried to find work but couldn't. This is the reality that can happen to us if we don't plan. This is what usually happens. So let's talk about what, how 401ks really, really work. We're told to put money in a 401k for about 20 to 35 years. And they kind of tell you, well, if you touch it, you're going to get this massive penalty. In New York State, if you touch your 401k, you're going to get taxed five times. Um, the thing is, you can't really predict what the rate of the money is going to be when you retire in the future. Again, you know, we can say 20 years ago, a gallon of milk maybe cost $1.50. Today, it's over $354. So that money that you're putting away over time is not going to equate to the real times when you really need it once you get older. But when you're retired and you can't replenish or make enough money to continue your lifestyle that you've been used to. Um, so money, you know, we don't understand and projecting what inflation is going to affect the type of money that we're putting away. In addition to that, there's this employer match deal that we're taught that the, our, 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 our employer will match. If we put in 4%, they'll put in 4%, et cetera. 
come to find out, if you read the fine print, in most cases, these corporations are not fully matching and are actually for every dollar that you contribute, they're paying you less, 99 cent less in salary. So they're really only contributing a penny. And in most cases in the fine print, you have to be with this company for four to six years, six years before you can actually gain or have take home that match that they've been giving you over the years. But the fact is that most of us are not keeping our jobs long enough. The average American keeps their jobs 4.2 years. So what that means is before that six year comes into play, all the so-called match money they were giving you, they're going to keep themselves. They're going to get it right back. Why? Because you're going to either get fired or you're going to get let go before your sixth year. So this is another game that's being played with us thinking that I got a match. Read your fine print. Go back and make sure if you're not at your job long enough, make sure you're there at least. Find out how, what's the maximum years you have to be there or the minimum years you have to be there in order to qualify for what they're putting in there. And the 401k is something that we need to understand is that the market is based on the market, how the market performs. So if the market's performing badly, then all your investments are performing badly. The fact is, is that the average return for a person that invests over 40 years in the market is going to get about a 1.8% a year in return in their investment. That's no different than what the savings, savings accounts are giving you at banks. So all that money you think you're going to have 20, 30 years from now, and if you're just starting out, or if you've been investing all this time, look, go back and look at your records and see how you had money at this amount, and then a recession happened or something happened, your money dipped, now it's coming back up. That's a volatile situation. And what if there was a market crash right when you were about to retire and you needed that money? See, we can't really, there's no guarantee that money's going to be there. And the fact is, the, four ways, uh, the 401ks are on their way out. Uh, 401k was a band-aid solution to pensions. You know, um, before there were 401ks, there were pensions where companies would pay their workers after they retired until they died. Well, that's, a, you know, that, if you look at that plan and if the, the longer the company stays in business, you're going to have more and more retirees and you're going to be giving them free money. That's not going to be a profitable uh, endeavor for the business. So they had to find a way to cut the bleeding and stop giving away free money. So the government came in and came up with a 401k plan where they now allow folks to invest money into the stock market. Well, it worked between 1982 to 2000, where people were now putting their money into the stock market. The market jumped up as high as 8.4% at one time. Um, but as of now, it's starting to kind of fluctuate. It's not starting, it's starting to even out and even going out to a bear market, whereas the money that we used to get is not going to be there anymore because it's being consolidated. So we have to understand that the 401k is at the end of its days as well. So all that money that you're putting there, if your money is low, it's probably because the majority of your funds are in the uh, tied to the country of Venezuela, who has been experiencing a recession for the last five years, and your money's being lost because their economy is not performing well. So that's the thing that you don't even have control of what happens, what happens with your money that you're putting away for your nest egg. Today, we have a total debt of nearly $29 trillion. If you look at the usdebtclock.org, if you wanna, wanna, always want to find out, they talk about we owe this money. Who do we owe it to? We owe it to different countries, China, Japan, United Kingdom, Brazil, Ireland, et cetera. Uh, but where is this money? How is this money created? It comes from our paychecks when we put in our social security. That money is funding this debt. And it's projected that paying off this debt, paying back to these countries, the money that we owe them because we outsourced all our jobs, we don't really create anything anymore, is that your social security may become depleted by the year 2033. So there's another vehicle that has ran its course and there's really not nuts nothing else put in place to give you that sustainability when you're no longer able to work, that money that you could depend on and you worked so hard for to put away is in jeopardy, okay? Recessions, again, happen 10 to 12 years. It can wipe out an economy or damage it significantly. The older you get, the more vulnerable your traditional nest egg gets. And experts will say, well, the next recession won't be as bad, but these same experts won't be there to refund your losses. It's all skepticism. They have no idea. So we must be mindful and being more informed about how we make decisions that are best for us, which means we have to get financially literate. Here's the thing. We're used to struggle, right? We know about struggle. We were born in it, right? But that's the 
I don't have a pot to piss the mentality that's been programmed in us. We don't have to be in struggle. We don't have to live this way. The obstacles that we have before us are employment instead of self-employment. We're thinking about working for someone else. And when you work with them, you're on their dime. And when they want to let you go, they'll let you go. Whereas we have to give professional courtesy of giving them a two weeks notice when we want to leave our jobs, they can fire us on the spot, right? Um, we're in a demeaningly increasing job market that is being taken over by AI, by AI. And then there's the lack of financial literacy and money management. There's lack in strategy, strategic investing. And we're lacking using arbitrage strategies to create wealth and improper retirement and transition wealth plan. A lot of us are dying broke. We're not putting away money. All these things can change if we use this simple plan. And I learned this from the likes of Warren Buffett, five hour rule. If you're not spending five hours a week learning about finances, you're being irresponsible. It's very simple. If you take 42 point, uh, 42 and a half minutes a day, seven days a week to learn about finances, you will be better off as time goes on. Because if we think about it, we waste a lot of time. And the more time they say it takes 10,000 hours to be a master of something, right? Well, a lot of us are masters of nothing because we come home from work to our credit. We work hard, but we come home and we're too tired, too tired to do anything else. I don't feel like reading. I just want to binge on Netflix or surf on Facebook or whatever. And saying that we waste the time in building this wealth that we need and therefore have nothing to show for it when the time really counts. Um, the net worth of white households is $190,000 as of 2018, and that is 10 times the value of ours at 19,000. There's the reason because of that, and it isn't just racism, it's also actual lack of awareness of financial literacy. We are significantly more likely to die during our working years relative to whites. The stress, the underpaid, overworked, the, the conditions that we face, the bills that we have, the overspending, because we buy stuff we don't need and we figure we'll pay it off later, don't think about the interest. That is why we are having these levels of stress and some of us are actually dying while working. More than 12% of us die, uh, who, who reach age 50, die within 10 years because of the stress of trying to con continue to make money because we're working for money instead of learning how to master having money work for us. So we don't plan for transition. Our beneficiaries inherit, inherit mainly memories and debt. And the lack of estate planning has fueled generation, uh, gentrification. Think about it. When an elder passes and the house is left to the children, the children fight over each other of the goods and things that they want, the dishes and the table and the TV or whatever, right? But after that, no one wants to take care of the house. No one wants to pay the taxes. So what do they do? They put the house up for sale. When they put the house up for sale, it allows other ethnicities to come into our communities and purchase those homes. And we wonder why gentrification has been so effective. Not only that, but also because we've been putting money in the banks. And I'll talk about that in a second. Um, but we don't have wills. We don't talk enough about wills and trusts, insurance plans. Um, the average American dies with over $70,000 in debt. And 75% die with outstanding debt. Most of it is a credit card debt. Then there's mortgage, and then there's auto, personal, and student loans. But it's all stuff that we've amassed, some things that we really don't need, those houses, those five bedrooms with the three bathrooms and or single, you know, things of that nature that we really don't need to be spending money on. Um, but most importantly, we do have insurance. I mean, we are the most insured ethnicity on the planet, but the insurance is mainly through our employers. And what we don't understand is that when your employer lets you go, so do you lose that insurance. So someone says, I have life insurance, that's great. But if it's through your job, well, understand that when you lose your job, you're gonna also lose that insurance. You need to get your own type of insurance. That's important. Uh, other obstacles is that we spend more money than we make. 40% of us are, 40% uh, of MasterCard holders are Pilates. Uh, many spend credit limits monthly. They spend over that limit and seldom pay the balance in full back. They make small payment. We do that minimum payment on our credit card thinking, okay, I, that's cool. I'll just give them $25, not realizing that we're getting hit over in compound and interest because the longer you take the payoff alone, the more times you're going to add that interest to those companies. And that's money in their pocket for free. Um, whereas Asian Americans have an average of three plus credit cards. We have about one. And that's because we only use credit for emergencies or vacations, you know, things of that nature. We don't use it as a tool. There are ways that you can use it as a tool to create intergenerational wealth, which I talk about 
in my book and in my courses. Um, and we also are the least to know what our credit scores are. On average, we have 612. We don't want to look at our score. That's the thing is we, we, we don't want to look at it because we know it's bad. But we need to face that because we, we might understand that we're not as deep in debt as we think we are if we just face it and look in the mirror. But here's the thing that really plays into why we are in a situation that we're in. And if we address these basic things, we can get out of it. We need to understand that we don't need banks. Banks need us. They even said it. Wells Fargo, 2004 annual report, banking is necessary, banks are not. They understand that by practicing arbitrage, arbitrage is basically when you're using monetary practices that you keep to yourselves, you don't share with the others. So they know how to make money and they make huge returns on their invest on our investments because we give them the seed investment and they'll give us maybe 1.82% in our savings if we keep $10,000 plus in our savings account. That's the reward we get, okay? The truth is, is that Americans owe over $1.56 trillion in student loan debt. That's over $500 billion more than the credit card debt. And it's spread out among 45 million borrowers. And this continued that allows loaners to make free money collecting interest. Understand when you make a payment, there's an interest affixed to that, okay? So if you take out a car loan for 60 months, you're gonna pay that amount that you send in, the percentage of, the percentage of that goes towards the, the, the amount of the car. And then the percentage of that is interest that the bank or the loaner gets just for the mere fact because they gave you the loan. OK, so if you are going to pay over 60 months, that means they're going to get 60 months of free money. But if you pay it off sooner, you pay it off, say, in 40 months, then they can't do anything about it. You'll lessen the free money. That's 20 less free interest payments they're going to receive. That's why it's smart to think about paying off debts sooner, not drawing it out and paying those minimum balances, paying it off as soon as possible because you're giving away free money. Here's an example. A person over here in college took out a $26,000 loan. And then she's been paying it off for 23 years faithfully. And so far she's paid back $32,000, but she still owes 45 grand. She took out 26 and it's, she's gonna be paying about nearly $80,000. That's because she's been paying these minimum payments. And the longer you make the minimum payments, the longer it takes for you to pay off that balance plus the interest rate. And that's included the free money that you're giving. And that's why that 45,000 is what it is, okay? We need to understand that the banking system only assists them. And this is how it works. They drive us to go to school to get these degrees. We get these degrees via loans that we cannot afford, that will take time to pay off over time. Some 10, 20, even 30, some are in our 50s and still paying off your student loans. That's free money out of all those months they've been getting in tuition. And then it's also a volatile savings model. It's no wonder we're having midlife prices earlier than before. You know, you think about it. If you've been in your, if you're in your 40s or 50s right now, you're probably like, yeah, I'm gonna get that sports car because I've been working my ass off for all these years and I have gotten me nothing. All I got is bills and I'm tired of paying bills. I'm gonna get me something I want. Or I'm gonna go to Vegas or Cancun or whatever because I deserve it. I've been working my ass off, right? That's the reality of it. But that's because we have been uh, working ass backwards pretty much. We have not been taught how to build wealth. And once we have these conversations, now we can switch all that around. So what do banks do with our money? First of all, banking is the most important business in the world. Without it, all businesses come to a screeching halt. Bankers lend money because they think that you can make the payments. They cannot loan their own money. They will not loan, loan their own money. They're going to loan the money that you give them. If I give them $1,000, if I put $1,000 in my savings account or my checking account, trust that thousand dollars is sitting in my account. The bank now has taken it out and they've loaned to someone else and they've created a relationship where that loan is gonna pay them back with interest. And guess who gets 0% from that loan? Us, the people that see the loan in the first place. But we're duped to believe that banks are the best place to keep it. How are we duped? Agitation propaganda. Turn on your TV, listen to your radio. How many commercials, banking commercials do you see? Put our money here, savings here, put your money here. They're basically seducing us to believe that this is the safest place to put it and not putting it under your mattress, which to a point I agree. But if you put your money in the bank, they take that money and they make money off of it and give you zero return on the investments they make from it. We empower the banks simply by our deposits. Uh, again, we've been told that it's best to keep it there. 
up until 1999, banks were basically in limbo. They had to wait for you to literally walk in your paper check. Because back in the day, you got a paper check in your hand or in the mail, and you walked it into the bank. The banks were waiting for you, twiddling their thumbs, impatiently waiting for you to walk in and make your deposits. Well, in 1999, things worked in their favor when they created direct deposit. Because now, even though when I worked at the NBA, we got paid every two Wednesdays, Tuesday night, my money was in my account. I didn't get a paper check. I didn't have to walk to the bank to do it. It was just automatically put in my account, right? So that meant that, meant that the banking system now knows that with direct deposit on such and such days, for instance, the NBA has 1,500 employees. They know of those 1,500, a percentage of them bank at Chase or Wells Fargo, that they can count on money coming in every two Wednesdays. So then now, now they can go ahead and execute these loans they're giving out to folks. They don't have to wait for us to walk in to give them uh, the paychecks any longer. So now they can expedite the ability to make more money. So this is what really where they really make their money. It's called the fractional reserve lending system. And this is public knowledge. What the bank does with your deposit, each and every single deposit from a dollar to however much money you put in your account, by law, the bank is able to 10X every deposit. So if I put in $1,000 into my account and I get paid, for instance, my job pays me $1,000 every two weeks, then that first week I get $1,000, the bank turns into $10,000. They only have to keep $1,000 on record. Now they got $9,000 free dollars that they can do whatever they want. So in this case, I use the example of someone that's getting paid fourteen dollars They deposit $1,400. It turns into fourteen dollars the Federal Reserve note, turns it into or the Federal Reserve Act created in 1913, allows them to 10x that account, that amount to $14,000. All they have to do is keep the original deposit on their books, $1,400. The remaining $12,600, they can now disperse to you and anyone else in the form of a car loan, a mortgage loan, a, a, a finance loan, whatever they want. And with each of those loans, there's a promissory note where you have to pay them the amount they've given you plus interest. And that plus interest and that entire arrangement you and I, who first put the money in there in the first place, that put that $1,400 in there that enabled it to be 14 k we get zero, nothing from it. This is why the banks have the most immaculate and most beautiful buildings in the world, because they've been financed by people like you and I, who make deposits every two weeks or put money in our savings and have it sit there thinking that, oh, my money's there. It's not there. If you had a million dollars, if you have over $250,000 in your account and you go to try to pull it out at one time in the withdrawal, they'll tell you you have to wait because they're going to have to consolidate some uh, some uh, some uh, exchanges to get that money to give it to you because it's not sitting in their vault to give you the $250,000 because it's already out there making money for them. So they've learned in arbitrage ways to make money work for them instead of them working for us, for it. And we need to understand that we can do the very same thing legally. Okay. So another thing that they do with the natures of loans, when you take out a loan, car loan or mortgage loan, things of that nature. In the beginning of that amortized loan schedule, where a percentage is going towards what you bought, which is a very small percentage, and then a very large percentage is going towards the interest. In this case, a person who was paying a $1,200 note on their mortgage, a thousand of that is interest. That's the free money the bank gets to keep in their pocket. And only 200 of that is going towards the house. And over the years, it isn't until the 20th year of this 30 year note, that half of the amount that you're sending in, 500 is going towards, uh, I'm sorry, uh, 600 is going towards the house and 600 going to the bank. That's why banks, as greedy as they are, within the first five years, you're going to get a phone call and they're going to ask you, would you like to make a lower po uh, payment by refinancing? Do you want to make a lower pay car note? Do you want to make a lower mortgage uh, a note by refinancing? What that does is when you do agree to refinance, it restarts the cycle back to year one where they're getting the majority of that payment. That $1,200 you're sending out, only $200 is going on that house. $1,000 is going in their pocket, and they're going to use that to give out loans and make money from those dividends. In addition to the amortized schedule with homes for you home buyers, homeowners, um, which you really don't own the house until you actually pay the thing off, it's just renting, uh, to be honest. Uh, you don't own the keys. They can come and take it, miss the payment. You'll understand. Uh, but when you look at this situation here, in a four-year period of a $200,000 home, 
the amount of interest this person is going to pay is over $46,000 in interest. And only $10,000 is going on the house. So by the end of the fourth year, a $200,000 house, you still got to pay $189,000. But you've given $46,000 free to the bank. Why? Because they gave you the loan. Well, actually, I gave you the loan in the first place. <laughs> That's really what it is. But we are not aware of that. And we, because of that, and because it's legal, they get to take advantage of that. But I can show you through my course how you can flip that on them and you can pay your house off in half, less than half the time. Here's another way they are showing they're reaching out desperately trying to get us because they're competing against each other now. You've seen these in your emails and in your, in your mailboxes. You know, they'll tell you, oh, you want to earn $500 cash? Open up a checking account and a savings account. And the first of all, we'll see, oh, yeah, I want to get oh, a quick 500. Okay, all I got to do is open up an account. Oh, uh, no, you got to deposit $50,000 to do that. You got to give the bank $50,000, which again, when they get it, they 10X that amount to 500 grand, half a mil, and they only have to keep 50,000 of that. So they have $450,000 from that 50,000 you gave them, created 450,000 for them to loan out to any and everyone else and make money off it. And the reward we get is a 2% APR if we keep 10,000 or more in that account. Now, a lot of us cannot afford to keep $10,000 in our savings. So for those that do, if you really think you want to, you got to give them five, you want, you want to make 500, you got to give them 500,000 or 50,000 first. Another, and they're targeting us. You see the ads, it's, it's black people. It's, they're targeting us. And they're telling you, you can get $300 if you open up a checking and $200 if you open up a savings account. And we think, oh, that's cool. I can get an extra $500, but I got to give them 20 grand. I got to deposit 20 grand to get $500. And they're going to take that 20 grand, uh, to blossom it up to 20,000. They take the 20,000, they keep 180 to themselves, keep 20,000 on the books, and they give it out to someone else to make money off of it. This is how they created this wealth. And these are, banks are not just institutions, they're families. They're people that own banks. Rockefeller owns Chase Manhattan. J.P. Morgan, these are families and descendants that are still here getting paid from those operations that are set up. So let's look at the amount of money up to 2018 standards, the type of money they're making. J.P. Morgan, $2.6 trillion in assets, 16,000 ATMs. I, I put that there because ATMs have different prices. When you go to the airport, you're gonna probably have to pay more opposed if you go to the corner bodega. The bottom line is that if you wanna pull out money, you're gonna to have to give them money to do so. Bank of America, 2.3. Citibank, a uh, Citigroup, 1.9, et cetera. Then I thought, well, how are Black people doing? How are Black banks doing? Well, there's 3,000, uh, there's over 6,000 banks, rather, and we don't even top the, the top 3,000. Less than 50 of them are Black. And the only billion dollar bank we have was started last year from the merger of City First and Broadway Federal, uh, who merged last year to create our first billion dollar bank. And it's not to say that we should take our money and give it to Carver or whatever these black banks are because they practice the same arbitrage measures. They take your money, 10 exit, and make money off of the dividend and give you zero return. This is not to say close your accounts. This is to say let's start playing chess instead of checkers and understanding how we can do this. Now, Claude Anderson, it said nearly a half century after the Supreme Court ordered racial desegregation, black Americans still bear six to eight times their proportional share of poverty broken homes, homelessness, criminal incarceration, unemployment, and other pathologies. It is difficult, extremely difficult for Black people to progress when the same hands that held the whip still hold almost all the wealth and power. And it is not in the best interest of others to help Blacks become more competitive. It's up to Black America to pull itself up by its bootstraps. Empower, empowerment will not happen by chance, accidents, or wishes. It will require purposeful planning. So why is all this relevant? Why did I David down on you for the last 45 minutes, right? Well, if you signed up to be in a rat race, there is no sideline. So you're not a spectator. You're either scoring or you're getting scored on. And we have been getting blown out, okay? It is 2021. We have been emancipated over 150 plus years and we are still having one point to the nation's wealth. That needs to change now. And it basically comes to knowledge of financial literacy. Systemic economics, we're going to always need money. So if anybody tells you, you know, <clears throat> it ain't about, you shouldn't be money grabbing and being on, on this money hunt, 
A lot of us have even, even been told in a religious spec that it's wrong to, to chase after money. And because of that, we've kind of inherited that idea, ideology that chasing after money is, a, is, is rooted in evil. People, some people say that money is evil. Um, we need to understand that that is a mindset that's been programmed to keep us away from using it as a tool. Yes, if you use money for the wrong reasons, it can be wicked. But if you use it to build wealth like other ethnicities have done, we can do the very same thing. Okay, so no matter how much education you have, these institutions will not teach you how to manage money. If they did, they'd be rendered powerless. Jeopardizing their bottom line is making money off of our ignorance. So how do we win? How do we win? Well, we've been taught that managing money is hard. And many of us become disinterested. You know, a lot of us don't want to look at our checkbooks. A lot of us don't even look at our balance statements. We make a deposit and we just keep depositing until we get that overdraft fund uh, remark in, in, a, in an email. We don't watch our money uh, and we don't, more importantly, build our money. But the bottom line is this is, a, this is our, I'll say, coming to Jesus moment where you have to really look in the mirror and understand it's time that we look at where we are. What is my credit score? What is my finances? What are my expenses? What is coming out and what's going in? What I bring in, can that cover what I have going out? Do I have to have as much going out? When you start realizing that, you might realize, hey, maybe I'm not as much debt as I thought I was. I thought I was 100 feet deep. I'm only three feet deep, deep. So in debt. So how can I work this out to a point where uh, I can create sustainability for myself, right? So this is about breaking the chain. The cyclical history of inheriting debt, of being ignorant and not studying about finances and still thinking that you're going to somehow make it happen. You're going to wait for God to deliver this lottery ticket or, you know, to make this thing happen when you can do it yourself. Um, not to say you can't do it without your ancestors, but the bottom line is we have to do the work because we're the ones that are physically here. Uh, if we're to break this chain, we must be aware of how the chain was made. Since arriving in this country, money has been used as a tool to shackle us mentally, physically, socially, and economically. So how do we break this chain? Through the study of cryptic or hidden ways it can be used to free us financially. I invite you to join this movement. And in this movement, just to give you an idea of what I've gone through in my first six months, this is uh, four years ago. I've gone, I went from living off savings and investments after being fired to mapping out a financial sustainable plan. I cleared $20,000 in debt and increased my credit limit 45,000 plus in six months. I raised my credit score more than 200 points. Uh, I lowered my credit utilization rate from 80% to 15%. I positioned myself to participate in business ventures. We often dream of including international business ventures and domestic foreign land assets. And I also created an intergenerational wealth plan for my bloodline 70 years into the future. Those that aren't even here are going to have wealth that I'm creating now because I'm learning how to employ my money and make it work for me instead of me working for it. This had to be shared with the demographic who I love the mo and, and need the most. And that's us. That's us. So with that, I wrote my book, uh, my fifth book, Apocalypse and Intergenerational Wealth Planning for Black People. It's available paperback, ebook, digital PDF, and audio book. Here's a table of contents of some of the things I cover. Um, the psychological traumatic, traumatic relationship of money and Black folk, the fallacy of 401ks. We've been told the lie about education, choosing the certification over having skills, the history of banking while back, Black, the keys to creating intergenerational sustainability, using money methods shared exclusively by the wealthy, how to become your own bank, borrowing from yourself, taking the dumb out of freedom and resuscitating Black Wall Street. I also created a course. I have a six hour uh, session, a master course, both self-paced and in-person uh, through groups or individual called the Crypto Wealth Sustainability Movement Master Online Course, where I work with you. And I discussed what I talked about today in detail and uh, pretty much put you on a path of, you know, getting rid of the debt that you may have and understanding how your job can actually finance the expenses you have and finance your future. So you can do all these things without having to take on another job, <clears throat> without having to invest more money, just understanding how the money that you do have and the credit that you have can be used to create intergenerational wealth. I basically break it down into five segments. Uh, the first one is finances. We talk about it. We get real, you know, real nitty gritty about it, real deep and personal. Um, this is your first step towards financial freedom. 
understanding your financial endurance number. And this is basically the things you spend your money on and knowing what that number is, because basically it's, it's a, a roundabout number that you have every month. And you multiply that number by 12 for 12 months. That's how much money is coming out of your pocket for the year. Then you find out, can your job uh, support that? And if it can't, we find ways to make it so. Then we talk about policy of credit cards and how instead of using it for that emergency or for that vacation, we put it to play to work as a tool because no longer is cash king here in this country. Only in America is credit king. And you can use credit in a way where you can create an unlimited number of, in your coffer of six to seven figures in credit that you can use to create the wealth that you need and sustainability and investing in things that can get you the things that you need and want and desire. Um, the next is expedite the expiration of debt. Understanding that it isn't about buying and not having a plan to pay it off. So yeah, think about, well, I get credit, I have to pay it off, right? Well, yeah, you have a strategy. And what is it that you're purchasing and what are you using it for? And can you use these purchases to employ the purchase so it's making money for you residually instead of you working for it? Um, I could teach you how to cut off your debt. You might be paying a mortgage or a car note that is you know, years away. And I could show you how you can cut that off in over half the time, uh, basically without taking, taking on another job. Uh, Recession-proof wealth transfer, which is very important. Being able to have our children or our loved ones or siblings inherit uh, not just not debt, but inherit some type of wealth, not just enough to put me away from my final transition wishes, but to have money they can use to purchase not only a home or pay off the house or et cetera, but to create a wealth transfer that enables them, gives them a leg up on being able to uh, basically exist in the society financially. Uh, and the last one is communal cooperatives. Think about this. If you have a community in your family, for instance, and all your family has 750 plus credit scores and very little debt and know how to manage their money and you guys decide, well, instead of us buying a house, let's buy a block. Or instead of buying uh, one business entity, let's buy a franchise. Or maybe we buy acres instead of buying one plot of land. You do this communally in your bloodline and you create the opportunity of creating something that your children's children's children will inherit instead of just memories and debt. Uh, all this course is available for $395. Uh, I try to keep it low because, you know, where some places you might pay $1,000 or plus, I'm trying to reach the, the, the appeal of our people because I don't want to be expensive, too expensive for enough for you to invest and continue to get yourself out of this. This is no scheme. This is a life skill. It's something that you can live and employ for the rest of your life and transfer to all of your family and relatives. Um, what you'll learn in seven points is you'll learn how to manage your finances, your timeline at the end of your debt, you'll take advantages of investments with excess cash without taking on a new job, you'll become financially sustainable and even fire your boss before they let you go. That's a fulfilling dream I had. I wasn't able to do it. They beat me to it. But if you're able to go ahead and tell your job, I am leaving right now. This is my last moment, not last day. I'm leaving right now and I don't have to give you a letter of certification or to ask or let you know that I'm giving you two weeks because you are now financially sustainable and you know that you have the money coming in is gonna take care of yourself and your needs. And then create intergenerational wealth and you will also become part of this family, this movement, the crypto wealth financial sustainability movement. And I have to quote our elder, our ancestor, uh, rather uh, Marcus Garver, who said, we must give us a silly idea of folding our hands and waiting on God to do everything for us. If God had intended for that, then he would not have given us a mind. Whatever you want in life, you must make up your mind to do it yourself. There's a reason why since Marcus Garvey's day, who created so many, uh, he created over a thousand jobs for people in Harlem, uh, employed many of us, gave us the, the idea of self-reclamation and doing for ourselves. And we have not had a leader come close to doing that as of yet. We must become those leaders. We don't have to find it in one person. We can all be that example for ourselves because collectively we need this example. The last course that I have available, and you've probably heard of it because when you hear crypto woke, you probably think cryptocurrency. Yes, I started out in cryptocurrency, still involved, got involved in 2015. I teach the basics about uh, cryptocurrency and how you can build wealth intergenerationally. This is an opportunity unlike anything we've ever seen. I'm not trying to make it seem like it's all glamorous. It does take some grunt work. It does take some understanding what this market is, but it has the potential to give you returns not like the stock market, which gives you about 1.8% over 40 years, or your savings account, which will only give you no more than 1% or two, no more than 
this has the potential to give you returns of six, seven figures, okay? Um, if you understand the right technology or the right coins to invest in and how to, more importantly, take care of it and not spend it, okay? This is something that cryptocurrency is becoming, uh, you know, fiat currency is on its way out. We're going to be using cryptocurrency. They want you to spend it. I want you to hold on to it and build wealth and value in it and then use that to create uh, a, 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 a revolving uh, increase in volume of money and you can pull out what you need to sustain yourself, but leave the majority in there to let it continue to grow. So I have these three platforms available. Um, this is a ticket to a larger mission because collectively there are some things that we can do and stop being on the sidelines talking about what we wish we could do. and We can actually financially put our mind to it. This brings me to the mission of what the Crypto World Financial Sustainability is about. My goal is to get 3,000 families, not just people, but families financially literate and on the path of sustainability, and then move those 300, 3,000 rather, towards physical and virtual cooperative communicating communities, rather, creating intergenerational, economic, ecological, and cultural resuscitation and preservation by way of joint vendors endeavors. What does that mean? That means instead of me buying a house by myself, if I had of a collaborative folks that are on the same page financially, everything is, uh, our, our credit is great. We have the ability to apply for these loans and we can pay them off. Then we can purchase blocks. You know, again, instead of buying one building or one uh, a company, we can buy a franchise. We create these opportunities so that we can start being producers instead of just being consumers. The last phase of this all, is for us to understand that as we're entering the fourth industrial uh, uh, movement here of AI and tech, our industrial revolution is happening as well. And it's a waiting for us to do it. It's gonna have to be with us. There's no one else gonna do it but us. Because if we don't do it, nothing's gonna happen. And the way we can do that is again, by doing sustainable community, uh, communal and commodity ventures. Uh, I have actually as a side, I created, as I mentioned, when you own your time, you can do the other things just like they've been doing. Elon Musk had the time to think about merging humans with, with robots because he's financially free. He doesn't have to clock in to go to work. He has all the money he needs. Well, if you get yourself in a position where all of your finances are taken care of based upon all your expenses, then your time is free. You own your time. Now that you own your time, you can think about those things you wanted to do before money became an issue. Maybe you wanted to own that business or maybe you wanted to be that uh, you know, that, that VC, maybe you want to be that, that person that invested other people's ideas. You can do that once you own your own time and you are able to create residual income through the investments that you learn through my course. Um, one of the companies I created, the new company now is, is Citrix Renewables, and it is a renewable energy company. Uh, we have new product coming out next week. And again, if I didn't take care of my finances personally, I would not have been able to create this business. It's both uh, LLC in America and also in Costa Rica. We are all about renewable energy and using this to create intentional communities for our, for our people where we can live off of solar. And not only solar, but we can live off of sustainable energy that enables us to not have to be on the grid if you don't want to. Maybe hard to do in America, but we can do it in other parts and in, in outside of America. And the bottom line is that we need to make this something not news. This should be normal. 19 families coming together to buy 97 acres. In Georgia, that's news. It should be normal. And it could be normal if we start working with each other and we start trusting each other. And that will get us in the situation we can get out of. Lastly, I just want to talk about the importance of STEAM. You know, education should never end. Uh, no matter what age you are, continue learning. STEAM, which came from STEM, science, technology, engineering, and mathematics, they added A for arts. I added on agriculture because we're going to need food. There's too many food deserts. Um, if you don't know anything about vertical gardening, uh, you know, we need to get into those types of things because we are being pushed into place where we're going to have to probably think about taking care of ourselves ourselves. And if we're not thinking that, then we are being naive. Um, but by the brother, by the gracious mindset of Brother Kiti Awudu, he came up with this acronym for SHIP, STEAM SHIPS, and the SHIP stands for spirituality, adding that to holistic health, innovation, prosperity, and sustainability. These are the steamships that Garvey was building back in the early 1900s that we now need to resuscitate if we are to have a say in our future. Um, so I want to.
close it at this point. I give thanks for your time. Uh, you're listening. I hope that there are some good questions. I see there's a lot of chat going on, so I'm looking forward to it. Uh, and I'm going to open up to Q&A. Let me just come out of my, escape out of my uh, thing here, get out of my, I'm going to leave the, the thing up there, but let me just bring up the window here. Yes. Okay. So, uh, Adwa, you can take over. Thank you for your time. Yes, thank you for that wonderful and informative presentation. Um, I know you'll be getting a lot of people signing up for your course, um, including myself. <laughs> so thank you so much. Um, everyone, if you have a question for Mbwebe and Shangi, please place it in the Q&A box. And while you all are gathering your questions, I'm going to also share the registration link for the Remembrance and reflections on the life and legacy of Dr. Renoko Roshidi. So I just placed that in the chat. All right. And again, please place your questions in the Q&A box. And we're going to um, start off with a question from Kevin. Kevin asks, for people 50 plus who did not properly plan or who got hurt in 2008, what do you suggest? Thank you for that question, Kevin. Um, first and foremost, uh, I'm just gonna say number one is that definitely consider taking my course uh, where I will show you step-by-step. Step. It doesn't matter what age you are, I'm 51 and I started four years ago. So um, I'm in the same boat as far as like, I was worried about should I go back to work or, and I have not worked for anyone for four years. I decided not to go back to the corporate plantation. So I can show you ways to basically uh, at age, at the age that you're at, if you are currently working, that's fine. If you're not currently working, then we have to figure out how we can start to use leverage. One of the things we'll use leverage as in, is, in, is in credit. You can use credit as a way to amass a coffer that you will never have in your banking account. And all you need to do is have the ability to pay this thing off. It's not to say we're going to start buying all these frivolous things, but your expenses is mainly your, your, your greatest thing that you spend money on is your basic expenses of your housing, your lot, your, your food, um, and your utilities and, and or loans and things of that nature. That's where you spend most of your money. So if we can harness that and find out a way how we can govern those things under a certain system where we're, we know how much money is coming out, and we know how much money we got left and we use that to build what's called passive income and passive income doesn't mean real estate. That's one way. I personally don't have a, a desire to find tenants to get into my buildings. I just don't. It's too much hard work for me. I want to put myself in time into something else. But for those that do, that's fine. Not to knock against it. But there's other ways of making passive income. The best way of make, making passive income is money that's being made without you doing anything. One way is cryptocurrency is one way. Another way is whole life insurance. There are ways that you can put money away and it will start accruing value over time. It's called compound interest. This is what Warren Buffett has made his money from. This is what Susie Orman and James Ramsey won't tell you how they made their millions, if not billions. It's basically by putting it in situations or vehicles that create compounded interest opportunities. So those are the things that I can show you in my course. Okay, um, AJ asked regarding student loans <clears throat> with the postponements due to the pandemic, what do you think we should be doing in terms of paying down the balance? Wait to see if determinants, deferments will continue or act actively pay down the balance. Very, very good. So <laughs> understand just because there's been postponement on the pandemic, doesn't mean they're not still hitting you with interest. And that's the gimmick. That's the game they're playing. Oh, we, okay, you don't have to send us a payment, but for every payment you don't send in, that interest is still due. So that's accumulating. So you should actually find out, and from what well, we're going on a year and a half of not making payments, then that's a year and a half's worth of interest payments that's been added on. They did that even for car insurance and for car notes earlier on in the year. They allowed, I have to make these payments, but they'll tack on the back. So nothing is free in this world, especially in this country. 
There's always a ploy. There's always a double meaning. There's always finite print. So my, I, my thought is if you don't want to make full payment, I would make enough payment to both cover pay, probably at least partial and covering the interest. You don't want to just pay the interest because then that's just free money you're just covering. So you definitely want to pay something down on the balance of your of your uh, bill, so of your loan. So I would pay, if you owe $300 a month, try to pay half of that and then add on the interest in there. So at least something is coming down. Just because they're saying there's a moratorium doesn't mean you can't send in money because that money is still going to be due. And they're hoping that you won't pay so they can add on more with interest. So I would actively be paying these things off. If not in not not in uh, in full. Okay. Um, another question. Can you talk about um, or advise about buying or investing in gold or silver in the form of coins or bullion? Okay. Um, interesting enough, it wasn't until a few months ago was I really interested in precious metals. Um, mainly because precious metals, you know, they're heavy. <laughs> you know, if you've got a whole bunch of coins, they're valuable. Uh, if you don't have a safe deposit box, please don't put every, anything ever in a bank. Don't put it there because it's not yours. You don't have a vault, the key to your vault. So it's theirs. But if you're going to buy something like that, you need to put it somewhere where, you know, it's safe and no one can take it. Um, but at the same time, um, the value fluctuates. And so for me, uh, interestingly enough, cryptocurrency as a counter, a fictitious, non-tangible form of money is valued at more than a dollar, more than more than a gold bullion. It's just, just understand that, that bullion is something that I can touch, taste if I want to, or hold, you know, and I guess it has a smell. But cryptocurrency has no, you can't hold it. If someone gives you a coin, you're getting got. It's not, it's not a tangible item. It's an actual digital, it's digital only. So you can't put your hand, you can't taste it, touch it, smell it, but it's valued more. It's something that is this bullion. Okay. So it's not to say don't invest, but I would say diversify. Look at the value and look at the return. Because you got to look at, you got to start looking at tickers. You got to start looking at the value of the gold and seeing how it's performing. Is it performing? Is it, what's the percentage of return for this quarter? What's the percentage of the year, last year? So you can get projections of what's coming, coming forward. I personally have not really gotten heavy into precious metals, um, although they could come in handy. If, for instance, the grid shuts down, uh, but understand, if you have a, a gold bullion brick and you want to buy bread because, you know, the banks are closed and, and everything is shut down and you're trying to buy bread with a brick, they ain't going to make change. They're going to take that entire brick. So even buying coins, the coin may have a certain value. They're not going to give you change for something that you desperately need, like bread or water. So that's why I'm kind of not totally invest in getting the precious metals. It's not to say you shouldn't get a couple but I wouldn't put my entire life savings in that because the precious metals is based upon what someone says is the value. What if they say the gold no, no longer has value? Then you got all this gold for nothing. And the other thing I want to say too with precious metals and even digital currency is these portfolios that were built black market, which is, I guess, good, even though the market gives you no return because this value is volatile, so volatile. But we have these portfolios. We now have these digital portfolio. Wi-Fi went on back. So we have the portfolio, but we're not liquidating. Got money and buying something tangible. The most tangible thing you can purchase these days is land. You can monetize it, live off of it, sleep, eat. It's, it's so that bullion or that coin I have, I eat it it was the same and i got a it's in season for me to buy with it. so more importantly i would probably take that that uh junk silver as they call it or junk silver or precious metals and i would convert it into something like land convert it into something that's tangible that i can really really need and use opposed to having a coffer full of digital currencies or 
a, a trifle full of coins that are too heavy for me to carry. Awesome. awesome. Hope that helps. <laughs> Yeah, so now um, I'm going to kind of combine a few questions that are sort of similar. So um, Marcus, Anna, and Christy are asking about how they can get more information about your sessions. So where can they register for your course? Do you offer individual coaching? If so, how much? And does your book speak about the topics presented tonight? Okay, um, I'm putting in here my website, CryptoWorkMovement.com, my email, uh, and it's, I'm putting it in, in the chat. Uh, yeah, so the question was, uh, wait one second, at gmail.com, there's the email. The question was, do I offer coaching? Yes, I do. Um, I also offer one-to-one -one and group coaching, um, the course, also, it once you and so that's the thing. This is a movement. So when you take my course, it's pretty much the coaching is that you're part of the movement. So now you're part of. of, of, of there's already about fifty of us already, roughly thirty five, no, about forty five of us that are in this group already, and we share information. We're working as a tribe to build all of our finances up so that we could do some things collaboratively, um, and collectively. So you will become part of this family if you want to. It's not, you're not obligated, but there are opportunities and things that we share in this space. Uh, but I am more than happy to work with you individually. And if you have groups, if you want to bring in your family, I've done families where I've had, you know, a person bring in their mother, their father, their brothers and sisters, and they all got it at the same time because we all know that when one person does it and you go to share it with someone, they're like, ah, I know you, you don't know what you're talking about. But if you bring it in together and everybody gets it at the same time, Imagine the come up the family has when everybody's on the same page financially. So that's something to offer. I forgot what the other question was. Um, it was about your book. Um, oh. Do your book address the same topics presented tonight? Yes. So the book, Apotheposin, everything I spoke about tonight, uh, it's in the book, but also the class itself is more in depth. Um, and it's and it's you know basically live and direct you know so the the Q and A is 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 not is there the walking hand in hand sessions and things of that nature but yes the book is very thorough in explaining and talking about a lot of these topics and more um, so I would advise if you feel like three ninety five is too steep or you don't want to hear me talk to you face to face because <laughs> you're tired of my voice or whatever um, getting the book could be helpful as well. Awesome, um, Lewis asks. What about those who are already retired? And then I want, I'm going to ask you to connect that to Njeri's question about how do you guide us with using Social Security? First question again, I'm sorry. Um, what about those who are retired? So what suggestions, financial suggestions would you have for them? And then could you tie that into using Social Security? Yes. So. Hopefully, if you are retired and you have you're living off your retirement, you have some savings. Um, there are a few vehicles that you can put your monies in. Um, more importantly, there's some a few vehicles that you should take your money out of. Uh, number one, if you have a lot of money in your savings account, it's not doing you any service. It's only helping the, the bank. If you have you know, five, $10,000 sitting in your savings account is just sitting there. Um, you're only getting, if it's over $10,000, you may be getting one, one point something percent APR as a gift for you leaving that money there. That money needs to be put to work. Um, there are certain things that you can put them together or put it into. Again, I stay away from the stock market. I do not at all invest in this Wall Street. Uh, the reason why is because Wall Street is rigged as they say, like in Vegas, the house always wins. There are not a lot of millionaires that invest in Wall Street, yet people still keep investing. People still keep buying lottery tickets, yet we get a, a millionaire winner ever so often because we're following this hope that maybe I'll be that anomaly and, and I'll be the one that gets it. Um, the point is, is that there are other more safe things to put your investments in, and it's all about creating passive income. So. For those that are uh, retired, for those that are receiving maybe a check that Social Security 
check it to receiving every month. Again, I'm going to uh, move towards taking the course. Inside the course, I show exactly where you can put those monies in a place that enables you to kickstart it and get it to work for you instead of you working for it. There's a, a few tools that you'll use. There's not one thing I'm going to show you. There are several things we're going to do together. We're going to, if you remember the cartoon character Voltron, we're going to use several different things at the same time. And it's not rocket science. It's very simple. But once we put these things to work, the money will be coming in in a way that it'll be uh, initially start slow, but eventually it will come very fast. It's called the concept of slow money, which is um, compounded interest, which is affixed to these investments that we'll put them in. So I, I hate to be cryptic, so to speak, and not give you the full Monty here. It's just not enough time to do it here. And in the course, I go full blown and show you every step of the way. As I mentioned, I have not worked for anyone for four years. I hope and intend not to go back to cor the corporate plantation. I look to be retired as far as working to make money. Um, in the next, I'm on pace to do that within the next two and a half years. So where I will, every residual money that comes in, it's gonna be coming in from a passive income. That is my goal. And that is something that I would love to share with each and every one of you. Great, great. So an anonymous attendee, as well as Maria, they're asking, um, what are your thoughts on working with a financial planner and or an investment planner to build black wealth? Are you either of these? And then also, can you speak about managing one's investments in cryptocurrency? So are there managers for okay. those type of accounts? Okay. So I'm, a, I'm the type of person, I don't like to dangle carrots in front of you. What I mean by that is get you to, you know, give you a little bit and then you keep coming back for more and I'm charging you every time, right? That's where people exploit other people. And that's something that I vowed to myself. I don't want to walk that path. I do, however, it's not to say if you take my course, okay, you've taken, I can't help you anymore. No, again, you're part of this family, this movement that, that I've created. Um, I think the biggest thing that's most important is uh, teaching folks how to do these things. And if they choose to, can do for yourself. For, for instance, I got in the crypto space, cryptocurrency space in 2015. Um, I'm that type of person where, you know what, I want to know at least a little bit of how this thing works. And as I learned how it worked, I realized it's not so hard to do. And now I see today Fidelity, uh, all these other, you know, uh, uh, Chase Manhattan Bank, all these companies now are saying, hey, we can manage your portfolio for you. We can manage your cryptocurrency portfolio for you. Or you need to get a financial planner that can set these things up for you. I'm my own financial planner. What I teach in my course is for you to become your own financial planner if you choose. If you need assistance, I'm here for that. That's what this family is about. This movement is about. I am exclusively dedicated to Black people. I only want to help us. So I say that to say that I would rather teach you and give you the ability to do for self because who's to say I'm here tomorrow? You know, when you are uh, that when you are predicated on what someone else is teaches you and they're only giving you bits at a time, if they go away, as they say, feed a man a fish, and what is, what is it? I'm going to mess it up. Feed a man a fish for a day. Feed, give a man a fish, feed him for a day, teach a man a fish, teach him how to, uh, how you know what it is. <laughs> it's late. I've been talking too much. But <laughs> yes. <laughs> thank you. you feed, him for, feed him a lifetime. Feed him a lifetime, right? So my goal is to teach you all to be fisher women and men and show you how to fish yourself because there come, may come a day when I won't be able to bring that fish. And if I don't bring that fish and you've been, uh, you've been basically determined, your, your success is determined on me showing up, I put not only you, but your bloodline in peril. So my goal is to teach you how to fish yourself so that now you can walk away and say, I know exactly what I need to do. It is not hard to do. And by employing the five hour rule, I've earned my hours of mastery. And now I can, this has become a part of my life because money is going to be something going to deal with the rest of your life. So why not, again, get intimate with it? Why not understand it? Why not spend a little bit more time understanding how you can get it to work for you opposed to you working for it? So my goal, again, yes, I am a financial planner, not certified, but I am a financial planner in the sense that 
I want to plan, show you how to plan for yourself, give you the ability to walk this path with yourself, with your family. And I'm always here as long as the ancestors are willing for me to be here. Okay, a couple of questions about your class um, coming from um, Anna, AJ, and Lavanda. How often do you run your classes? Are the classes live sessions or are they pre-recorded? And do you need to have a certain amount of income or do you need to have an income or a certain amount of money to build wealth in your program? Amazing questions. First of all, uh, let me get them all right. Is that um, how often do I run the courses on demand? So if someone wanted to sign up today, I will be giving you a call. I know my internet is going down a little bit. Hold on. Hopefully my internet is back. It was bugging out a little bit. So I know that um, if someone signed up for a course, we're on. A, I'm on the phone and I'm checking out or emailing and checking out your availability. We can do it. And that's how I do it. I live this thing. So my I'm available on your time. I pretty much, uh, for the most part, with group sessions, I do Mondays and Thursdays, but I also do individual sessions. The, each session is one hour. Um, if you want me live, I also have pre-recorded. So I will send you the entire thing and you can go at your pace and you can have all the courses there and, you know, and do it at your leisure. Um, and uh, what was the other question you asked? Um, do you have to have income uh, was this? amount of money? Yes. Beautiful. Now, mind you, I started my, my journey, zero income. I, I was unemployed. So no, you don't have to have money, but you have to have the ability to make money, of course. Um, have to act, have access to something. If you don't have money, then we work on your credit score. So, you know, if you don't have money or if you don't have ability to earn money, we can work on figuring out how we can bring in some money because you do have expenses and I'm sure that you're finding a way to pay those things off. So that's what we look and see. What is your FEN versus what is my income and see if you have any cash flow left over. But you don't have to have to make a money and to get to that sustainable amount, and I meant to mention this as well, is when someone says, you know, how much money would you need to be okay? Most people will just say, shoot for the, for the moon and say a hundred, I mean, a million dollars, right? They will want a million dollars. Well, my thing is this, is that, you know, you, you don't necessarily need a million dollars because most likely if you get a million dollars, you're probably going to blow it on stuff you don't need, right? So really what you really need is what's called your financial endurance number. Your financial endurance number is when you take all of your expenses that you have every month. I have a light bill that's due, a cable bill. I have my cell phone bill, my gym membership, uh, my car loan, my uh, life insurance. You have bills that are due every month. That's a roundabout number. You have food bills. You, you spend a certain amount on food. You spend a certain amount on entertainment. You have a certain amount that you spend every month. That number, if you multiply that by 12, that is your expenses for the year. So if you are spending $1,000 a month, and that's a low number, then you have a $12,000 expense every year. Now we take that FEN number and we compare it to our income. Does my job pay me enough to make $12,000 a year? And if it doesn't, what do I need to do to get there? So I walk you through all this. It may seem like intimidating and please trust, it isn't. It absolutely isn't. I hope that some things that I spoke about tonight may have let you understand and realize that we really don't have a choice. Whether you get financially literate through me or anyone else, we don't have a choice because the job market is taking away our jobs, our ability to earn. So we have to become entrepreneurial in spirit. If we don't, we will not be able to put food on the table. So it's imperative that we take this conversation this evening and uh, take it to heart because it's not about me selling you a class. It's about me introducing you to a lifestyle where you understand that these lessons are something you're gonna use for the rest of your life. How to govern money, how to employ money and put it in a place where now I don't have to worry about, am I gonna lose my job this month? Am I gonna, I hate my job, I wanna leave my job. All these type of things that's pulling away and adding stress as we get older and seeing that we have very little saved in our retirement years. 
So this is what this conversation is about. And I'm hoping that you all are feeling me as I, I love this topic and I'm hoping to be as, as, as of service as I can be. Awesome. So many great questions, but the last one that we're gonna take for tonight is what are one or two key things or strategies that people could employ now to get started? Okay. Uh, I'm just putting here also in the um, in the chat, you can email me your questions even when we get offline um, so we can continue the conversation if need be. Um, uh, so I'm sorry, run that question to me again, I'm sorry. Sure. Um, what are one or two key things or strategies that people could employ now to get started? <laughs> plug, 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 right? Uh, take the course or get the book. Uh, figure out what I just mentioned about your FEN. That's something you can do right now. You can figure out, uh, make a list of all your expenses and know what that number is. So you know that my number is this. And then you understand that by multiplying that by 12, this is what I, I have for expenses. And then you compare your, your job and your, your annual salary. And does that salary allow you to meet that number? And if it doesn't, then what necessarily you need to do? Because I can show you through my course that your salary, breaking it down to hourly, it'll tell you how much money you need to make an hour to cover your expenses. If you're making $1,000, uh, you're, still, you're spending $1,000 a month, and you're, which is $12,000 a year, and your job is paying you $10, well, then your job needs to be paying you at least $10, right? But say the number is much bigger than that. Maybe you're spending $40,000 a year. That, you know, that number is different. But the bottom line is we need to know where we stand right now with our expenses. So doing the FEN is something you can walk away with. Um, I implore you to even go to my website, CryptoWokeMovement.com. I have articles that I've written about. There's this class, uh, there's um, videos I've done on my YouTube channel as well that you can get through via the website that speaks about finances. And the most important thing you can do to get started today is employ the five hour rule. Begin learning about finances, spending five hours a week learning about finances, be it through me or getting on YouTube University and just listening to other folks talk about it. Uh, Claude Anderson, uh, he's a jagna and a guru in, in finances. Um, there's a plethora of people, but again, don't get caught up in the hype of the market sale, you know, or of invest in this currency and you, and you have FOMO, fear of missing out because this movement is saying, go ahead and, and buy this stock. Don't do anything until you are sound in what your approach is and what you want out of it. So I would employ that, you know, just, you know, again, if you're interested, feel free. I would be absolutely happy to help you in any in your journey awesome thank you thank you so much um this was an excellent presentation as you can tell from the chat people um, i'm very appreciative of what you came to offer i love the energy that you brought um people yeah, are, are signing up for the courses so that is wonderful this is definitely something that we need um someone in the uh, uh mentioned about examples of commute of cooperative commun communities. Um, so as you mentioned, your course will give us uh, the steps to do that and actualize that. So thank you. I wanna remind everyone, um, first, thank you all for coming out. Thank you for being engaged. Thank you for sharing your questions. Again, um, and Webway's email has been placed in the chat. So if you have additional questions, feel free to email him and also check out his website. Next month on September 15th, we will have Tony Browder as our, present, as our presenter for IKG Wisdom Wednesday. And wanna also remind you to register for Sunday's event honoring um, Renoko Rashidi. And on that note, I want to uh, pass it back to Mwebe if you would like to have any final closing remarks. Yes, um, you know, <clears throat> I, again, uh, it humbles me uh, thanking you um, for you know, the entire IKG family for doing the work that you do in creating this vehicle. Um, again, salute to Baba Anthony Browder for spearheading this and then having the, the vision and awareness to get the younger folk involved so this thing continues past him. 
this is something that we need to be about passing that baton. I salute him for that. I'm trying to do the very same thing. We all are trying to do that because this is bigger than just us as individuals. I thank each and every one of you for taking out time on this Wednesday evening and still on listening to me run my mouth. Um, I enjoy, obviously, you know, I, I love running my mouth, but I, I more importantly love talking about relevant things. And I hope that you found this evening's conversation relevant and important and must be taken in action. Uh, so please know that I'm here, uh, ancestors willing, and hoping that we will continue to uh, have dialogue and exchange so that collectively we can start bringing this utopia that we so deserve that we're gonna have to build ourselves. And I'm down with that. It's time to get our hands dirty, y'all. Yes, thank you. All right, thank you yes. so much. Thank you everyone for joining us. Thank you everyone that's live on Facebook. We haven't forgot about you. Thank you for joining us. And again, this presentation is being live streamed on Facebook. So you can always go to the IKG cultural resource page to rewatch this presentation and any previous Wisdom Wednesdays. Thank you all for joining us and see you next month, September 15th with Tony Browder. Peace. Before you go off, before you go off real quick, is there a way to get all of these chats? I know we are offline. This is this is behind the scenes, right? <laughs> but is there a way to save these chats? Because I, I still want to, you know, if anybody have questions, I would love.